Hi, this is Waylon Hedigard, and this is part two of our labor history series. In our first lecture, we looked at the time when unionism arose and at the terrible conditions that the factory employees worked under, conditions that would eventually force them to band together just to keep them and their families afloat. Now, we are going to look at those early battles fought while trying to form the first unions. We're going to take a close look at the long and vicious war between capital, those with money, and labor, those who worked for those with money. We are also back in the United States to stay. We spent much of the last lecture in England discussing the conditions of the Industrial Revolution because that's where it all started. Remember, when it came to the Industrial Revolution, America was behind. We were discouraged as a colony from having any factories because England demanded that they make all of the money from factory production. After the American Revolution, however, large-scale factories soon became a force in this country. And that is where we will concentrate from now on. For all the horrors that the English poor suffered, an equal number were endured by working-class Americans. We may have started late, but we quickly made up for that lost misery with a vengeance. Before most factories dominated the landscape, however, most of our early labor management battles were small, but they were certainly plentiful. There are numerous examples of strikes with unions trying to get better wages. Labor was scarce competition light, and workers often had leverage. As time went on, though, this power began to be offset by the law's increasingly harsh view on any group of workers making demands of their employers. Our courts and legislatures began to look at these workers' groups as combinations or conspiracies against business. Since trade unionism that's the idea that each individual trade or craft organizes its separate union. Since trade unionism used strikes that organize workers together to stop production, this was seen in the eyes of the business community and the laws of the land as unjustly harming commerce, threatening profits, and hindering competition. It was seen as a form of intimidation or even blackmail. Hence, the earliest attempts at unions were viewed by many as no better than organized crime. And then, like now, all it took for this idea to be made into law was money and power. Think about this. Workers who were simply demanding enough in wages so their families could live without hunger came to be viewed as the same as mobsters running some sort of protection racket. For instance, in Philadelphia in 1806, eight bootmakers were indicted for being part of a combination and conspiracy because they demanded higher wages and injured their employer's business by withholding their labor. Simply agreeing to not go to work became a crime. They were also accused of threatening any replacement shoemakers and agreeing with each other to never work for any employer who wouldn't give them the wages they demanded, but their true crime was that they slowed the profits of their employers by having the nerve to demand more for themselves. For this, the courts determined that they had violated the law of the land and they were fined $8, about a week's wages, plus court costs. Unfortunately, this set the legal precedent for the next 34 years. It was illegal to band together to make life better for themselves, but only for employees. Employers, on the other hand, could do what they wished, combining together to set prices and wages, conspiring to lower operating costs. They called this democracy and the glory of private enterprise. An owner should be able to do what he wished with his property, conspire, combine, incorporate, that was fine. But to workers, this lopsided view of rights was anarchy and ruin. 
employers banding together to enhance their profits were considered excellent managers and heroes of the business world, while employees banding together to enhance their wages were no better than common criminals. As the pressure that the Industrial Revolution placed upon American workers ramped up, nevertheless it started to become obvious to many that workers would need some ability to combine just to survive. Their employers were simply too powerful for a single individual employee to have any influence on his condition. In the fight between David and Goliath, the Davids of the world needed to fight as a team. Nonetheless, the belief that there is something wrong with employees withholding their labor persists until this day. America strove to catch up to England's industry, and as with England, America's first large factories were in textiles. This sector became the site of the first major strike in America, and the technology that drove it came here by one of the first cases of industrial espionage. You see, England knew it had a great thing with all of its amazing technology, and it knew that the longer it remained the only operator of those machines, the longer it would remain on top. The machinery its people had invented and perfected had made it a leading power in the world, and it tried to fiercely protect those machines from being imitated. Any way that plans or information could get out was prohibited. People leaving the country were searched. Mechanics who had worked on these machines were denied visas. Their version of Homeland Security protected these secrets seriously. But they couldn't stop everyone, especially those with sharp minds. Francis Lowell, a visiting American, took extensive tours of the English textile mills and managed to memorize the entire operation. Since even the English have difficulty regulating the brains of individuals, he slipped through the net and returned to America where he and his partners soon built a mill of their own in what came to be known as Lowell, Massachusetts. Now these people well understood what the English mills had done to the common person, and they honestly wanted to avoid that in their own country. The mill and surrounding town were built to be a model of America's ability to treat its workers in a fair and just manner. Since the majority of people working in these mills would be young women, they couldn't just leave them to look after themselves in this cruel and dirty world, so they built dormitories, complete with house mothers who would protect the women's honor. This was the early 19th century, and a company couldn't just have women hanging around men unsupervised. On the positive side, the houses were clean and the food was good. Drinking, gambling, swearing, and of course men were forbidden, and church attendance was mandatory, but free libraries, very rare at the time, were created, and many houses had shelves full of books for its tenants to read. World-famous men and in this sexist era it was only men, were invited to give lectures and classes that the young women would be encouraged to attend. Many young farm girls made real money and had legitimate opportunities to better themselves for the first time in their lives. It was a remarkable achievement for a while. America's first experiment in full-scale industrialization became known as the Lowell Miracle, and people actually came from around the world to see it. I'm serious. They were said to be everything the English mills weren't, clean and orderly, and empty of shattered humanity. Americans were very proud of them. They were proof that we could take the best of the Industrial Revolution, yet leave behind all the worst aspects. We could have our cheap goods and high profits, all while keeping our workers healthy and happy. And for a while, this illusion lasted, but only to those working outside the Lowell factory system. For those inside, the novelty of working at back-breaking labor all day soon wore off. 
The women working in these places began to complain about the lack of breaks and the exhaustion from the long hours, 12 a day, 6 days a week. But these complaints weren't very strong as long as the wages stayed as high as they did. But as we have seen, wages remaining high was unlikely as the number of mills in America increased. You see, it's easy to be generous to your employees and still maintain high profits when your mill is the only game in town. Monopolies have a great deal of freedom, but as mills sprang up all over New England, competition grew and started to drive down those all-important profits. Within a decade and a half, the factory owners were already pressuring the workers to go faster and to do more. Using the proven techniques of speed up, where foremen turn the speed of the machine to be work higher and higher, and stretch out, where a single employee is made responsible for more and more machinery, the women of Lowell found their existence increasingly difficult. The hectic pace of trying to keep their machines running left the women too little energy to read books or to get much out of the lectures. Their off time became as ruled by exhaustion as their English counterparts. And still, the complaints remained only that, complaints. It wasn't until the owners cut their wages that the Lowell workers, those same enlightened women that America was so proud of, finally had enough and walked off the job. As the first major strike in U.S. history, it didn't go over so well. Since it seemed to take the workers by as much surprise as it did the management, the strike was disorganized and soon crushed. Its leaders fired, most of the women went back to work, and reluctantly accepted the cut. But the Lowell women now knew what to expect, and they knew the cuts weren't over. Their books and lectures had supplied them a better education than their employers would have wished. They planned for the next battle, so when the pay cut came, actually it was a serious raise in their boarding costs, it brought them out of the factories and into the streets. This time they were highly organized and united, leaving the factories in shifts, with some even living at home to save money. This action put a constant pressure on the owners, who soon caved and the raise in room and board prices was dropped. The Lowell girls, as they were called then, had won a victory over their employers, the first of its kind on American soil. You know, there's an idea in American labor that the rights we enjoy today were won mostly by white American men. But this first major labor victory over management by the women at Lowell tells us a different story, as will the numerous strikes won over the years by African Americans and immigrants. Though it's true that the women had won a well-deserved victory, it would prove to be a short-lived one. As time passed, it became clear that the days of the Lowell miracle were over. The pressure of competition increased, and the conditions decreased with each new American factory. And these factories were not even trying to look after their employees. This forced Lowell into the same mentality. Since the local workers found it difficult to live on the ever-shrinking wages, factory owners found it cheaper and easier to bring in immigrant girls and women to replace them. Often fresh off the boat and desperate to find a job, they would take work at lower salaries than any local woman. If American businessmen, like the English factory owners, can get workers cheaper, they will, regardless of any morality involved. To illustrate, consider this. In 1836, 95% of the workforce at Lowell was native-born and from the area. By 1860, that had dropped to 40 percent, and by 1900, the percentage of local workers fell to 8. As you can see, the well-meaning Lowell miracle had slowly turned into the same nightmare the rest of the world was experiencing. As industrialization spread across the nation, unions, strikes, and labor unrest followed. 
Across the country, capitalists were gaining massive fortunes far more quickly than ever before, while their workers dropped into poverty. Labor simply felt that it was not getting its fair share of profits. They wondered how a system could possibly be considered just where some can gain uncountable wealth while the people who work for them starve. In essence, that question is the same question we have today. Would this wealth be possible without labor's work? Capital was important, and most of labor was willing to concede that. But labor was important too. If the workers are important, the question became why aren't they valued more? The current system, however much wealth it created, was unfair to the one that actually did the work in the first place. During the Civil War, this unfairness was cruelly emphasized by the hated United States policy that allowed the wealthy to spend a mere $300 and get out of the military draft. The working poor could never come up with so much money, but those with wealth could buy their way out of fighting and danger. Thereby the soldiers that won the victory for the United States were virtually all working class men. While men like Carnegie and Vanderbilt and J.P. Morgan spent their time getting incredibly wealthy off their country's war, the working class spent that time suffering and dying in it. With these fortunes, a new wealthy class set out to conquer America. During and after the Civil War, industrialization boomed. The age of steam had arrived in America with a vengeance. As railroads spread across the country, other industries, now having cheap and efficient ways to ship their goods to market, sprang up in cities all along the new routes. Since these in turn needed a huge amount of other materials, Mines and processing plants of all types were required to build and maintain them. Coal mines, iron mines and coking plants, blast furnaces and rolling mills, logging enterprises and sawmills, slaughterhouses and tanneries, to name just a few. Each industry required the others to even exist, but also fed them their products. Everything grew together, competing with each other, buying each other out until many companies grew large and powerful, near monopolies in their businesses, and became that much harder for wage earners to bargain with. The Goliaths just kept getting bigger, while the Davids? Eh, not so much. But as companies grew and wages dropped, it became apparent to most of the working class that the only thing they could do to combat the incredible power of their employers was to band together and fight them as a union. Whereas a single employee has little power, a thousand of them has considerably more, and 10,000, now they can get things done. Employers, not willing to give up an iota of control, resisted unionism aggressively, and I do mean aggressively. Understand that at first labor unions were small affairs, workers from a single county, city, or even employer. But it was at this time that the idea of national labor unions began, a union that would reach all across the United States to help its members. One of the first was the Knights of Labor, and it attempted to lead the mass of industrial workers and craftsmen. This was an organization that started off as a secret society, much like the Masons, but eventually came into the light and fought for not only workers' rights, but pay equality between the races and sexes. It meant well and had great intentions. Unfortunately, the Knights took on battles in a nearly accidental manner, stumbling into them so reluctantly it was hard to determine what their plan actually was. They also had a bad habit of pulling out of these battles just as the workers seemed to be winning. The head of this particular organization, Powderly, so alienated the members that eventually they drifted away into newer, less random acting labor unions, like the American Federation of Labor, the AFL of today's AFL-CIO.
more about them a little later. Before we go there, let's talk about a few of the major events that occurred during the Knights of Labor peak membership. The first is the Great Railway Strike of 1877, one of the largest mass riots in our history. At this time, railroads were America's first huge corporations, and as you can expect, often acted with complete disregard for their employees' well-being, or their stockholders, or the American people, or honesty, decency, or morality. Really, a history of the railroad corporations is much like a history of organized crime. It's just that some of these crimes hadn't been imagined yet, so weren't quite illegal. That they got away with even the truly illegal ones just proves that nothing will make problems go away like spreading around a lot of money. From openly bribing members of Congress to price fixing, from defrauding tens of thousands of stockholders to purposely embezzling millions from government grants, corporate railroad officers were willing to try anything they could get away with, and that was nearly everything. But they did make money. Oh, did they make money. This entire era is called the Gilded Age, and for good reason. Name that as an insult by Mark Twain, it came to represent what American society was to the working class. A system rotten to the core with corruption and poverty, but gilded with the wealth of its most famous families. Many spectators only saw the wealth, the mansions, the luxury and money, but failed to scratch the surface and find the real America underneath the one where the working people worked harder for less and less, one where poverty and desperation ran rampant. And nothing represented the Gilded Age more than the railroads. Although the service they provided was valuable, crossing the entire country in four days, just think of it. The hatred they generated across the land was also immense. But isolated from reality by their money, when they finally pushed people too far, no one was more surprised by the backlash than they were. This backlash became the opening battle in the great wars between capitalists and their labor that continued for over half of a century. And I do mean war. Until now, the strikes and other labor disputes had remained mostly peaceful. But the Great Railway Strike ushered in an era of often incredible violence and destruction. As owners' control over the workers increased, those workers grew more willing to fight back and fight back hard. At the same time, the owners and the government became willing to use violence and murder to protect business interests. This led to American troops supporting American businesses firing on American citizens and immigrants. And American citizens, shot at and beaten, weren't going to stand peacefully by and just allow it to happen. Here is where that all began. In 1877, America was suffering from an economic panic brought on, in part, by the financial misdeeds of the railroads, shady dealings that would have fit right in with our recent banking crisis. Seeing a decline in profits, railroads soon felt the need to cut costs and did so by reducing their major expense, their employees' wages. At times, they refused to pay the workers on time, often weeks late, and then they paid only in company scrip. Basically, these are IOUs that could only purchase items from the company-owned stores. This was like employees of J.C. Penney's only getting paid in J.C. Penney gift cards. It guaranteed that railroads get most of the wages back. It also guaranteed that those employees would have to pay whatever the employer wanted to charge. They then demanded that each worker do more at greater risk to themselves. For instance, they insisted on running double headers, trains with two engines, and twice as many cars, but only the same number of operators. 
increasing the danger considerably. Remember that this was an age where boilers and machineries had to be carefully watched and tended to avoid explosions or dangerous breakdowns. So much of our machinery today runs without trouble that we forget that equipment used to be far less cooperative. To add to the problem, railroads also took to forcing workers to sign an injury clause that allowed the employer to escape from any liability for the numerous injuries which occurred every year. To quote a common saying of the time, a brakeman with both hands and all of his fingers was either remarkably skillful, incredibly lucky, or new on the job. Though the use of safety features would have reduced injuries, the railroads refused. Safety cost money. In the words of one trainman, condolences come cheaper. But all this became too much when they added a wage cut on top of the rest. People will take a beating in so many other ways, but cut their money and they'll rise. Starting in West Virginia, trainmen abandoned their trains and refused to allow anyone to run them. When the state militia was called, they were driven out only to be replaced by federal troops who did force the trains through. But the unrest was far from over. Unled by any labor organization, workers and the general poor joined the movement by the thousands. Sheer hatred of the crooked railroads allied people as diverse as small businessmen and mechanics, farmers and shopkeepers, socialists and landowners. It was the working class, however, that all out rioted. In Maryland, the governor, in trying to stop the riots from spreading, did something that virtually guaranteed it. He unthinkingly sent in the Maryland National Guard, right at quitting time for the local factories. Being patriotic Americans, the workers cheered the troops at first. But as word spread that the soldiers were there to keep them under control, the cheers turned to shouts and then to stones. The first regiment was driven off, but the second opened fire and killed ten men and boys, who were armed only with the rocks at their feet. These were just the first of many, because upon word of these deaths, the real violence began. In trying to prevent a riot by force, the governor assured that one would happen, and that when it did, it would be terrible. The fury and rage spread far across the eastern and central U.S. Workers left factories and shops in sympathy until much of the working class around the nation was in the streets. In Pittsburgh, officials fearing that the local militia would just join the protest brought in more willing troops from hated Philadelphia. The act of bringing in American troops to oppress American workers only made the situation worse. And when these troops opened fire, killing 20 people and wounding several dozen, including women and children, the fury of the crowd was such that the soldiers were routed. In Chicago, the police, private security, and militia fought a running battle against workers throughout the factory districts, making the protest even worse by attacking any group, whether they were rioting or not. All in all, the entire eastern United States suffered from serious unrest and even insurrection. It's not known exactly how many died in the riots, at least 40 dead in Pittsburgh, 30 in Chicago, certainly well over 100 in all. In addition, dozens of buildings, hundreds of locomotives, and thousands of rail cars were completely destroyed. The country was brought to its knees while American soldiers fought American citizens. Ironically, a dozen years after the end of the Civil War, the veterans chose two sides again and opened fire once more. Though now the dividing line wasn't the Mason-Dixon, but the amount of property you owned. Lacking any understanding of why his workers were so upset, the railroad baron Tom Scott's answer was, Give them a rifle diet and see how they like that bread.
this attitude did not exactly help to bring peace. One lesson that business owners and government officials should have learned from this was that it would be better to allow a union to head the discontented workers, if nothing else than to prevent them from acting so recklessly. A union would be something to bargain with, someone to negotiate a settlement with, someone to stop the rioting. Having someone in control, anyone really, means that events are less likely to get so far out of control. Also, having an accepted outlet for workers' concerns likely would have prevented the breakdown before it happened. Simply accepting the idea that workers had legitimate grievances would have gone far. Yeah, this would have been an excellent lesson for the powerful of this country to have learned. It wasn't the lesson they did learn, however, but it would have been a good one. What the business interests did learn was that the best response to labor unrest was quicker, more violent action, more troops into the cities, faster. So if there's trouble with the majority of your citizens, the solution is not to try to find out what it is and to try to fix it. The solution is to keep hitting them with a stick. If they still struggle and fight, simply hit them with a bigger stick. If sending troops in proved to be a disaster, it only made sense, if you were part of the moneyed men, to send in more troops even sooner. This is the time when large cities across the nation began construction of downtown armories. Castle-like in appearance, many of these were fully equipped with cannons and rifle slots. Let me assure you, this was not to protect us from invasion. The idea was that when labor trouble arose, there would be a fort within each city that could be used to put it down. Most Americans have forgotten what these buildings were for, but believe me, they were not to repel Soviet troops parachuting into our cities. Their stated purpose was to allow rapid deployment of National Guard troops to keep working people in check. Going even further, in Chicago, always a hot spot in the wars between labor and capital, the business class formed their own militia in order to quell any future riots. When the working class followed suit in the interest of protecting itself, Chicago lawmakers found a way to outlaw labor's militia as something terribly dangerous, while keeping the business's troops complete with their Gatling guns. This did little to settle the workers' fears or tempers. Their issues, unresolved or even taken seriously, the working class districts became a bomb, just waiting for something to set it off. And it wasn't long until something did. Now, pay and safety were big and obvious issues for the working men and women of the United States, but they were hardly the only issues. A major push at this time was for the eight-hour day, which became a sort of moral crusade. In their view, long, uninterrupted hours of work made men and women into virtual machines, able to do little more than labor and care for only basic personal needs. What people required was time off. What they wanted was a real life. At a time when the 12-hour day was commonplace, the idea grew that in order to be a true citizen, something more was needed. Activities like music, culture, reading, anything to improve themselves would not only help them as people, but would benefit all of society. People who were forced to occupy their entire day with nothing but grinding work were no better than slaves, and having a well-educated and well-adjusted workforce would create a better nation. This, combined with higher wages, would also allow the workers to buy the products they made and would grow the economy as a whole. If workers could share in the country's wealth, production would rise dramatically, creating more jobs, profiting everyone, rich and poor alike. If this great republic could promise a producer a modest income 
and the free time required to become an educated citizen, a worker could climb out of poverty to gain independence and self-respect. The people then weren't asking for a handout, they were really asking for freedom. The first step was to regulate the maximum work hours to eight, and the movement gained rapid acceptance with the working class. Workers took to the streets chanting, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. The Knights of Labor got behind the movement, although, as usual, reluctantly. May 1st, 1886 was set as the day of a national general strike and march. Workers all over the nation would walk off the job and demand this basic right. And though the business class was terrified of possible violence, the day passed peacefully. This was not to last, however. On May 3rd, a confrontation occurred at the McCormick Reaper factory in Chicago between striking workers and the police and resulted in hundreds of strikers being wounded and four shot to death. This violence brought the city of Chicago to the edge. The local radicals and anarchists, people who think the government is oppressive and should be eliminated, planned a rally at the Haymarket Square for the following day, urging workers everywhere to come out in support of those killed. When the event took place, several people spoke, and although they urged workers to defend themselves if attacked, the speeches were calm enough that Chicago's own mayor, who had attended to see what was up, saw little danger and went home early, even telling the crowd of police officers to do likewise. Sadly, the police did not. Led by one Inspector Bonfeld, a brutal officer known for using deadly force against workers, they thought it better to confront the crowd, the day after killing four of these same people. As the last speaker was wrapping up his remarks, they charged the wagon he was standing on and demanded that the meeting be broken up. The speaker reluctantly agreed, but as he was crawling down from his perch, an unknown assailant threw a bomb into the middle of the tightly assembled officers, killing one instantly and creating a vast deal of confusion. The police, already tensed for violence, opened fire indiscriminately. Men and women were shot at random. But due to the smoke and confusion of having a bomb explode in their midst, the majority of people who were injured were those closest to the officers themselves, namely other police officers. An anonymous police official told a reporter, and I quote, a very large number of the police were wounded by each other's revolvers. It was every man for himself, and while some got two or three squares away, the rest emptied their revolvers mainly into each other. Sixty officers were wounded, eight killed, mostly by friendly fire. At least four civilians were also shot to death. Well, this proved to be an excellent excuse for a witch hunt against any troublemakers a city didn't care for. Evidence was both found and manufactured. Witnesses were interviewed, and bribed, and coached. Dozens of labor activists were arrested, and eight finally brought to trial for murder. All this without discovering who even threw the bomb. All eight men were convicted on the idea that, although the prosecution admitted that they didn't know who threw the device, these men didn't stop it and had advocated for unrest and self-defense. Several, the prosecution admitted, had not even been at the Haymarket that time. But nevertheless, seven were sentenced to death, and the other to 15 years in prison. His only crime was editing a radical newspaper. Of the seven, two had their sentences commuted to life by repudiating all they believed. The remaining five, however, refused to disavow what they felt most important and were left to die. One committed suicide the night before his planned execution by somehow setting off a blasting cap in his mouth, and the last four were hung. The city even managed to screw that up 
by not breaking any of their necks with a drop, but instead strangled them slowly. To this day, the bomb thrower has not been identified. The one thing that is fairly certain was that it was none of these eight men. Sure, they were radicals. They believed in fighting back when attacked. But in reality, they were killed because they stood up for the working people and their demand for a better life. So what good came out of this? Well, the Haymarket Affair became a rallying point for labor everywhere. And around the world, labor activists have held up this travesty of justice as an example of the willingness to sacrifice all in order to move labor's cause forward. All the efforts to execute these men for their ideas only made certain that those ideas would enjoy a long life, even if the men who held them didn't. From this point, the war only worsened. With the last two strikes of the Gilded Age, involving the largest corporations in the United States, the Carnegie Steel Empire and the Pullman Palace Car Company, backed by a combination of the largest railroad barons. First, let's revisit our old acquaintance, Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie, the Scottish immigrant from our first lecture, who became incredibly wealthy, then gave it all away, was the owner of the Homestead Steel Mill. Though Mr. Carnegie always expressed public support for workers' rights to join unions, he was also obsessed with efficiency and profit, and he began to see that the main obstacle to his profit was his employees' wages. In constantly updating his factories, he made skilled labor less and less necessary, and the highly skilled steel workers found themselves at a disadvantage when facing the new machinery. Confronted with the choice of making his factories even more profitable at the expense of his employees' wages, Andrew Carnegie was troubled by the potential damage it would do his reputation. Profits and efficiency stood on one side, the well-being of his workers stood on the other. He could choose to further his profits, or protect his reputation for being a fair and just employer, or he could try to do both. Unfortunately, he chose profit solely. This is not to say that the union remained blameless for the strife. The Algamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, the union represented all the skilled iron trades at the Homestead Mill, resisted most technological improvements that would have increased production. Having won unionism in 1882, they proceeded to reach too far in attempting to control this not allowing the full effect of the improvements that Carnegie had made. This put them in the unfortunate position of resisting change, and resisting change has always been a losing battle. Carnegie's sin was not that he wanted change and efficiency. It was that he chose to destroy the Union and its workers rather than negotiate a reason with them. Had he chosen to share some of the profits the changes would have earned him, it is likely that he could have convinced those working for him. Rather, he saw the Union as an obstacle, not one to just overcome, but by 1892, one to destroy. Since Carnegie valued his reputation as the benevolent capitalist, he preferred not to get his own hands dirty. He left the actual destruction to his subordinate, Henry Clay Frick while he fled to Europe for an extended vacation, timed perfectly to cover the entire strike. Although Carnegie publicly supported unions, Frick, on the other hand, was severely opposed, both publicly and privately. He considered the breaking of Homestead's union essential to the continuing operation of the mill, and he would do whatever necessary, moral or immoral, illegal or otherwise. The trigger event was a wage increase requested by the union. Steel prices were up, company profits were high. The union wanted a share of the increasing profits, but Frick saw this as his opportunity and he attacked. He countered their wage request with a 22% wage cut and layoffs for many of the most skilled members. 
Just as he planned, negotiations rapidly broke down. But Frick had planned well. A high fence topped with barbed wire surrounded the plant. Sniper towers overlooked the buildings. High-pressure water cannons were placed at each entrance. He was ready for war, and it was a war that he planned on winning. The workers were locked out at the end of June, and immediately ads were placed in the papers around the nation looking for replacements. The strikers were determined to keep the plant closed, so picket lines were thrown up and manned 24 hours a day, even including a series of boats guarding the neighboring river. Tensions escalated as the company tried to get replacement workers into the plant, and the union tried to keep them out. At first, Frick tried to use sheriff's deputies to open the way. These were quickly surrounded by the union men, forced onto a barge, and sent packing down the river. He then hired the notorious Pinkerton Detective Agency, a private security force well known for brutal union-busting tactics. To avoid the picket lines, they opted to use barges towed by tugboats to sneak in their 300 armed agents in the dark of night. Unfortunately for them, the Union caught wind of this advance and were ready for them. Insults and stones were hurled at the agent's barge, and when the agents tried to disembark outside the plant, shots were fired. Witnesses disagree as to who fired first, but regardless, one agent and one worker were wounded in the first volley. The agents then opened fire into the crowd, and the crowd returned in kind. The firefight ended in a stalemate with both groups suffering fatalities. Their barge being stranded, however, the Pinkertons knew that they were in trouble, with no means of escape. The strikers had been shooting at them all morning. A small cannon had been set up, and there had been a couple of serious attempts to set the barge on fire. Soon, they had had enough and were willing to surrender and throw down their arms. To establish a peace, the Union leaders promised them safe passage out of town, and the Pinkertons agreed. Unfortunately, some of the workers and their families didn't quite see things this way. As they ran the gauntlet of workers, the agents were assaulted with sand and stones and clubs. In spite of Union officials trying to stop the carnage, several disarmed Pinkertons were beaten unconscious while horrified newspaper reporters and city officials looked on. The public was shocked. This was really the day the strike was lost. Before this event, much of the country supported the strike, supported the workers trying to keep food on their tables. But as word got out of the violence done against disarmed men, public opinion of the strike turned against the workers. But then an even worse event happened. Worse overall for the strikers. The entire country's attention was focused on the Homestead strike when an anarchist, unrelated to the Union, decided to assassinate Henry Clay Frick. The assailant shot him twice and stabbed him four times, but somehow failed to kill him. Even though the Union had nothing to do with the attempt, this was the final straw for the public as a whole. The beating of the Pinkerton agents combined with the attempted assassination destroyed the majority of the public support. After that happened, it was only a matter of time before the strike was utterly lost. The Union was so thoroughly broken by these actions that the Carnegie Steel Plant, soon to be U.S. Steel, remained non-Union for 40 more years, a harsh lesson against Union violence for all involved. This loss then set in motion a fierce campaign to deunionize all the steel mills in Pennsylvania, and by 1900, not a single unionized mill existed in the state. In an even more ominous turn, trouble was brewing in what was supposed to be a worker's paradise outside of Chicago. George Pullman, inventor and businessman, wanted to recreate the Lowell Miracle. He had peered deeply into the working-class ghettos of Chicago 
and worried about the trouble such places could breed. After growing rich by changing the way people traveled with a luxurious Pullman railway car, he decided he could change how his workers lived with a clean and comfortable town designed to his exact specifications. He knew just what would make them happy. A well-laid-out town with all the amenities, churches, stores, parks, even a theater and library. Straight streets ran between rows of apartments and houses, everything well-designed and clean. But George Pullman was also quite sure of what else would make his community thrive, and that was rules. Rules like no alcohol, no prostitution, rules against littering and even those that restricted tobacco. He even instituted a curfew and had a network of informers who let him know if any violators or troublemakers were in town. The rents for the housing in Pullman, Illinois weren't cheap either. You see, Pullman did not believe in charity. Like the early capitalists, he believed in everyone earning and paying for what they got, no exceptions. He thought it perfectly fair that Pullman workmen paid above average rents, even though workers had nowhere else to live. You see, George Pullman refused to allow anyone else to build anything in town. He owned everything. Pullman Company houses were maintained by Pullman Company carpenters and fed from Pullman Company stores. The workers in those stores lived in Pullman Company houses. This experiment of a company town, an idea that would become so hated in the later wars of labor, became the focus of a struggle that would question America's direction. Like most of the unrest of the past, Pullman workers, many of them immigrants, tolerated Pullman's rules on how they should live with only grumbling. Coming with yet another panic in 1894, pay cuts again proved to be the trigger event. Drastically reducing wages, while keeping his own and his officers' salaries high, and of course paying high dividends on Pullman's stock, which he owned a lot of, was simply too much for his employees. But what really drove them mad was that while decreasing their salaries, he kept the rents in town as high as ever. Remember that he doesn't believe in charity. All of his businesses need to make money, and the town where his impoverished workers lived was no exception. Since rent and other expenses were deducted from salaries before they were actually paid, Many people were left without enough to buy food or fuel. They were forced to borrow and sank quickly into debt. Desperately, they sought for some relief, and Pullman agreed to meet with a group of employees to discuss the issue and promise not to retaliate against the group's leaders. But when three of those men found themselves without a job the next day, Pullman employees tired of the greed and deception of their employer, walked off. The workers asked for the support of the American Railway Union, of which they had just become members, and this quickly led to a nationwide boycott of any train that pulled Pullman's rail cars. Not pulling Pullman cars hurt Pullman directly. He didn't just manufacture the cars, he retained ownership and only leased them to the railroads. Suddenly, much of the rail traffic west of Chicago ground to a halt, and then the accusation started. The railroads wanted federal troops to force the trains to move again and claimed that the situation was out of hand and that violence was ramping up. This was merely a scare tactic as the governor of Illinois said that the claims were barefaced lies. The mayor of Chicago himself donated to a strike relief fund and wore a white ribbon in support of the workers. But the railroads were determined to break the strike completely, and only federal troops could guarantee that. To make that happen, they had to ramp up the conflict. Their strategy was twofold. First, they would place mail cars in every train along with Pullman cars. Since it is a federal offense to interfere with the mail, the government would be forced to take action. 
Secondly, they saw an opportunity to misuse a rule that was originally meant to curb the power of corporations and turn that rule against the people it was supposed to help. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 was meant to keep corporate trusts and monopolies, such as railroads, in check. But corporate judges warped the reading of this act to say that unions, by stopping trains, were inhibiting competition and free commerce and were thus breaking the law. Unions were suddenly the corporations the law was meant to stop. It would be amusing if it were not so sad how when applying the same law to real corporations, the original targets, the same courts would nitpick the language to make it powerless against those with money, yet use the broadest possible interpretation when it came to unions. The courts issued injunctions against continuing the strike in any way, even speaking in support of it. When these injunctions were ignored, Debs and other leaders were arrested, leaving no one in charge of the strike. The troops were then sent in, and the predictable violence erupted. Hundreds were wounded, over 30 killed, while the strike was crushed. Since the federal government came down firmly on the side of Pullman and the railroads, the lessons the unions took from this affair was that government was never going to help. They had no friends in Washington and troops would be called whenever workers tried to air legitimate grievances. It still amazes me how the laws and the courts can be made to say anything given the proper amount of money and power. As we have seen, money trumps morality any day. But not entirely. Though Pullman won, undeniably, his name was blackened by the whole affair. His victory had a heavy cost. For starters, the Illinois State Supreme Court ruled that company towns were in opposition to good public policy and incompatible with the theory and spirit of state institutions. And Pullman, Illinois was soon sold off. Moreover, as a man who valued his reputation for improving his community and country, he was devastated by the public reaction to the strike. Though the public had turned against the strikers, they did not turn towards him. Reputation shattered, in his last years he developed a paranoia of assassination, constantly wondering whether his employees would seek vengeance. At the very end of his life, and filled with this fear, he became so obsessed with the idea that revenge seekers would dig up and desecrate his grave that he actually designed his tomb to be a fortress with separate thick layers of lead, iron, and concrete. It's sad to think that the man who designed the greatest rail cars in the world lived out the rest of his life in terror because of his actions. In addition, a commission formed to investigate the strike's causes and effects, while not holding the Union blameless, and they were not, criticized Pullman for being both employer and landlord. They also strongly condemned his refusal to arbitrate the dispute and attacked the railroad barons for conspiring to destroy the Union, a combination, even though they were just another combination. Finally, it scolded the government itself for not adequately controlling monopolies and corporations and for failing to reasonably protect the rights of labor and redress its wrongs. Its recommendations included the increasingly popular idea that the recognition of unions, instead of their destruction, would offer a controlling group to deal with instead of the mob, which is who actually ruled when union leaders were jailed and the organization denied. As you can see, with the exception of the women of Lowell, Labor lost nearly every major battle in the 19th century, especially those of the Gilded Age. But our fights were not entirely in vain. With each battle lost, with each worker's death, America was forced to confront the needs of the working classes. Conditions in the factories were easy to ignore, but deaths in the street were not. 
People could ignore those living in poverty and slums, but it became impossible to ignore rifles firing and buildings burning to the ground. By bringing the battle into the streets throughout the country, the workers forced the American government, its businessmen, and the public at large to notice the injustices around them. It was slow work. Society, like individuals, couldn't change overnight. But every battle pushed the needs of labor a little further. From the first battle to the last, unions grew in strength and organization. The first fights were more reactions of the mob than anything planned or organized. But by the end of the 19th century, strikes were being led by a well-organized, intelligent, and dedicated group of people. These people and the groups they formed learned from every loss, every death, and every injury. They learned how to fight, and they learned when to fight. But importantly, they learned what to fight for. While some wanted to change the entire world, others felt that the only way forward was to fight for small gains, one baby step at a time. Regardless of how they viewed the fight, what they wanted could best be summed up by Samuel L. Gomper's famous quote. When asked, what does labor want? He responded, we want more schoolhouses and less jails, more books and less arsenals, more learning and less vice, more leisure and less greed, more justice and less revenge. In fact, more of the opportunities to cultivate our better natures, to make manhood more noble, womanhood more beautiful, and childhood more happy and bright. Although a bit grandiose and certainly old-fashioned, isn't this what we all want and need down deep? This is Wayland Hedegaard, and I'll see you on the next one.